afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Morris. I'm a writer for CBR.com, ComicScience.com, various other websites like that. Uh, I'm here to host the Writers in Conversation panel today. Um, we have three of 2000 AD's finest um, here to talk about their process, how they got into the company, um, the, uh, the style of 2000 AD, and um, just the general idea of like, writing for a living, how it works, how it operates. So, I'd like to introduce them as they're sat next to me. So first up we have Rob Williams, who is the writer for the Grievous Adventure of Ichabod Asriel. Grievous Journey of... Close. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, Judge Dredge, you've written for as well. We have Al Ewing, who is the writer for uh, Zombo and Damnation Station, and uh, Judge Dredge as well. Uh, hello. <laughs> and we have uh, Emma Beebe, who's the, uh, the writer for... Um, uh, Judge Anderson and the Alienist and Judge Dredd. And Survival Kings. And that as well. Uh, please round of applause for the uh, panellists then. <laughs> so, I thought we'd start off with where people first got into comics, how it started off. So, um, 2000 AD have a very specific entry route. Into, into writing for them, and I believe um, Rob, Al, you both followed it, Emma, you went a slightly different path, and we'll come to that later. Um, what is a future shock, first of all? I've, n I've never done a future shock. Um, I, I kind of managed to avoid that. In fact, I, I pitched, my first ever pitch to 2008, I've told this story in the past, is uh, I sent in to David Bishop when he was editor, and he replied and he said, congratulations, you've sent in the most unoriginal future shock. <coughs> We've ever we've ever done in 2080, um, which so that was a nice way, brutal way to start. Mm. But no, I did a I did a book called Class War for a company called Comex, and then I as as a lot of magical things happened. I was in in a pub one night with Andy Diggle, and, and he said you should write for 2080, and and that was kind of that was how I got in. Mm. Um, and well, Al, we'll, we'll come to you then. Al, yeah, what's a future I, shock? <laughs> what is a future? Um, <laughs> yeah, back in the day, a future shock used to be, and it's not anymore, now it's tougher, uh, but it used to be five pages, twist ending, um, science fiction, or my, my very first one ended up being a terror tale, and it was a kind of a horror, uh, a short, short little horror bit. And yeah, basically, I, I did it by, uh, at the time, the submissions guide, this was back in 2001, and they just printed or reprinted the uh, submissions guidelines to tell you kind of how to how to do it and it's basically you know you have your you have your covering letter with the plot synopsis you have your uh, you know your five page scripts and send it in through the post and then you wait and uh, you know I waited a long time nothing nothing came of it so I sent in another one which involved thug snorting cocaine made of powdered thrill power and uh, and Matt didn't like that one as much, but he did say he did say that he quite liked the first one. If I made some changes, which was mostly just chopping the amount of words in it by half. Um, and and yeah, so so I was quite I was quite lucky in that in that the first thing I sent in got printed, and it's it's a bit like gambling. You know, you win once and then you're hooked. So after that, I just sent in loads and loads and loads, and they all got rejected. So I went through, I went through the standard, you know, rejection process, uh, which is very important. Uh, a very important part of eventually uh, getting somewhere with 2000 e is to be rejected loads of times with future shocks. So uh, if you're if you're in the middle of that road, you know, keep plugging. Do not give up hope. Um, I am I am going to take a minute to to just really big up the whole. Uh, the, the future shock process because I think 2000 AD is the only remaining and correct me if I'm wrong but I think it might be the only remaining kind of comic publisher with an actual open submissions process I don't know about there might be things like Boomeroni where they've got something like that but 2000 AD have always been very upfront that like I think six months out of the year now they will just take five page twist ending well four page twist ending thing from anybody and so that is a really it's a really nice thing that people can do but yeah that is that is something that if if you're interested that is it's still a doorway into <laughs> bloody hell <yeah. laughs> all in all citizens the no slain no gain panel will begin in 25 minutes in millicom still like has, that gone, <laughs> has that gone back 
Uh, was it 20 minutes open before? Open in five minutes. So if you'd like to queue now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Who's up for like a block wall between meetings rooms? <laughs> yeah. I like a Rowdy Yates block. Who's with yeah, I'm, I've, I've never written Slain. Has anyone here written Slain? Fuck nope. Slain. <laughs> Rough, we're renaming the panel. It's now about how much we hate Slain. Great. Right. Uh, anyway, yeah, sorry, moving on. I've, I've hugged the mic enough. Yeah. All right, Emma, you came in a, a different route uh, yourself. Um, you were co-writing with uh, Gordon Rennie, is that right? Yes. Um, I mean, I... Partly I didn't go the, the main route because I was already, was already writing. Um, professionally I was doing film and game and Doctor Who uh, audio and things like that. And uh, So I hadn't really started in comics and the Dread thing came about because we were, Gordon and I were in the pub talking about how seven-eighths of the population were about to be killed off and the kind of stories that there would be after that. And because, you know, we'd had a lot of wine and... So inevitably we came up with the story and we were a bit like, right, well, maybe we should pitch. It seems a bit ambitious to go in and be like, hi, so we've not met. Um, but at the same time, we were also pitching around um, survival geeks. And we'd started off with it being quite a different story. It was, it was seemed a bit older. Uh, it wasn't quite so silly, but 10% less silly. Uh, so um, it was, yeah, it's... It, it kind of went this different route, so um, so we, I went in with that and doing a, a thriller. So I did that, and then Dread sort of happened about two weeks after or something. So the pitches kind of went in very similar timing. So one went in, and he was like, "All right, okay, we'll see how this goes." So it, it, in the end, Dread came out first, um, and then Survival Geeks, the the thriller, actually came out. I think three issues into that Dread story. So it, it seemed this very strange. So process, with... which I cannot remember in what order it all happened, mm. but um, it was it was a bit roundabout. Mm. But yes, um, and oh, Rob, I think I uh, uh, got it completely wrong. You didn't do Future Shock. Uh, what was the first comic you wrote with 2008? Then uh, I did a strip called Asylum with uh, Boo Cook. All right. How did that? How did you get in with that? Then how was that? Um, was that uh, just talking in the pub? You just picked yeah. It through I there? mean, Andy Diggle said, uh, I, I think liked uh, Class War and he said you should write for 2000 and I pitched uh, Asylum and then I think Andy left uh, just pretty much as I submitted the pitch. I'm not entirely sure my pitch was the reason that he left but it may have been um, and then Matt Smith took over and, and I did kind of remember thinking of a time where well, well maybe you know the guy who's invited me to pitch has gone um, but Matt published it and, and we've kind of gone I've gone on from there but it was a weird thing and, and possibly I think I would have benefited from doing Future Shocks first to be honest with you because there's a very specific pacing to working for 2000 AD to doing that five page um, or six page structure um, and, I, and, and I hadn't done that so I think you, you know you, my first couple of series would, were a little bit me floundering trying to trying to you know, get a feel for it, you know, to get a hang, hand, uh, hand on the pacing. Because my first ever printed comic work was 20, 22 page comics, you know what I mean? That's how I started out. Yeah. So you actually went, you actually had to go from doing the 22 page, you could do almost whatever you want, splash pages or yeah. decompress it, then you had to start compressing it into a very tight space. Yeah, and, and like anything, when you start doing this, I mean, you, you learn about pacing and you learn about not over cramming certain panels with dialogue and information and all the basic things you do as a when you're writing comics but it takes time it's like anything else you know what i mean it um you you, you get a feel for that as you go so uh, you, not not many people come in fully formed with the, the, the first thing they they write is fantastic off the except block. for al except for al <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, the 2008 style is, is pretty much a detailed full script, and uh, Al, as you went straight in with that style um, on, your, on your future shot, um, how's it, what's it like working in that style? Does it give you a, sort of a best preparation for everything else you'll get in comics, because you're working such a compressed piece of work? Yeah, it's, it's really good training uh, for anything else you might do in comics working on 2008, and, and future shots especially, because you have to sort of uh, create and in most cases destroy a world in like five pages uh, and you know it, it was five pages in my day when I was doing a lot of future shocks now it's four so the um, 
the young kids coming up from behind as, um, I don't know what that band is. I'm losing my edge. Losing my edge. LCD sound system. As LCD sound system so memorably sang, uh, the kids are coming up from behind with their four page future shocks. And it's like, yeah, they're, they're really learning density. But it's, it's, yeah, it's learning density. It's learning to do a lot with a little. And, you know, and yeah, when you start out, you're sort of overcompensating a little. You're putting like, I used to put like, I don't know, 50 words in a balloon. And Matt, Matt Smith knocked that out of me real fast. But it was like, I'd have, I'd have like 75 words in a panel, you know, crazy amounts of dialogue, really cluttering the place up. And, you know, you learn, you learn to do a lot with not very much. And then, you know, if you move on to longer comics, like 20 pages, I mean, the first time I did a 10 page comic, which was the magazine, that felt like an ocean. I was like, I was, I was doing nine page episodes and I was devoting like, I was having like a whole splash page doing splash page endings every episode just to like fill a bit of space because it just seemed like an ocean of space to me and and yeah so that served me very well uh doing the american stuff because you know 20 pages that's like four episodes of a 2000 ad strip so you've really got room to breathe uh emma when you're working you work uh, quite a lot of god and many uh, as a co-writer um, so how does that work for, for you then? Because you're not only writing the full script, but then either yourself or Gordon are then reviewing it, tweaking it, going back and forth. What's that process like with you? It's a madhouse. Um, it, it works quite well just with practice. I mean, we, um, we tend to write separate episodes and then go over each other, but not always. We've swapped kind of mid-episodes, kind of like, I, I don't know what to do with this, you do it. Uh, which is quite nice because you can get to that bit where you, where you know you don't really know what to do and then you can just be like, so I've done the first three pages. Here's the cliffhanger, off you go. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is the really tricky bit. So, so you can kind of go to and from, we've both done that. Um, so, so we just sort of make it, we just sort of make it work. But um, yeah, we don't, uh, we have very different approaches <laughs> in that I, I love to outline, I like to know what's happening on every page, I like to know my cliffhangers, I like to plan. And if the plan falls apart, then I, I know it has no, it's, it's not working in practice, but I'd rather have a plan to work for, whereas Gordon's a bit like, right, so the story's about this, and then this probably happens, and, and we'll see how it ends. So we kind of had to find a way to make, to make it work, so yeah. that, you know, if we were writing episode two and episode three at the same time, that it wouldn't, if he was doing two, then three would cease to make sense because it no longer ended the way that we had agreed. Mm. So, so we have to, um, we have to kind of find a way to make sure that we, we know at least what's going to happen by the end. So, so it's been a process, but you know, I think we've kind of mostly got it down now, mostly, most of the time it's okay. So. One thing's interesting about Scars and is that um, not only have you got the, the idea of doing your own stories, future shocks, or, or any bits pieces, one shots and continuing pieces, but you've also got this sort of mini shared universe of itself. You know, you've got the uh, Judge Dredd, you've got all these bits that connect into each other. What's it like when you first come to 2000 and then you get to start pitching for them and work on established characters? Is it hard to get into the voice of them? Hard to get into that style? Or is it something that once you've done all the other work, it just kind of flows into it naturally? It's intimidating uh, writing Dread. I mean, I don't know if you found that. You seem to take to it very sort of naturally. I, I was like, it took me a few years of like kind of going, oh, you, you feel a bit sort of. And he's, it, I think Dread's a, t a tough. I, quite, I like writing Dread now and I enjoy it now and I think I've got a handle on him to a degree. I think for a, for a few, few years I kind of struggled because I think he is. He, ostensibly on the surface he's this robotic figure but then there's this churning kind of thing going on underneath you know what I mean which is which is really interesting to write I love writing that you know the subtext of a guy is, is what I find most interesting yeah I, I, I had this thing where Dredd is not allowed to feel any emotion he's not allowed to display any emotion he's not allowed to feel any but the omniscient narrator is allowed to hint that he might have an emotion <laughs> And that was, that was my rule that I did, that the omniscient narrator could sort of imply things. But like, that was the level of, you know, barrier between any, any churning emotion Dredd might have and like the surface of him. In that, you know, you could sort of imply that he was struggling with raging depression, which I, I kind of did constantly. Um, 
Because, you know, he'd just been through chaos day. He was going to be struggling with depression. Um, but, and I think you were, you did a lot of that. Yeah, well. I just kind of dealt with it like he's in a horribly depressed, violent man who's just thrashing out at the world. But he just has been kind of like poured into this vessel of the law, which is the only thing that saves everyone from him, I suspect. I think there's one line in a story I did with Henry Flint where um, someone reports back to Hershey about him and says, he said, well, he's, 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 he's a- something like he's angry, but he's always been angry. It's just, it's lucky he's our angry, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, Emma, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, it's intimidating. It's, you, you sit down and be like, right, dread, colon. Um, and you kind of know, I mean, with me, I, you know, when we were co-writing it and Gordon sort of assumed that I would not want to write Dread and I'd want to write the other characters that were our characters more about us, but like, no, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't turn up to write other characters. I'm, I'm here for Dread. I'm going to be writing Dread. So, um, and I think you know when you've got it. And I knew when I got it when, uh, as does sometimes happen, my plan for what I thought he would do and what he actually did were, were completely different things. And it was like he kind of looked at me and went, why, why would I do that? I'm doing this. And he sort of took over, and that was great, because then I thought, right, Dred's in charge now, and, w- and it, it was much stronger as a result, so I felt like I'd, I'd, I'd got it at that point, and that was really, that was really nice. When, when you said Dred colon, I was wondering if that was a location. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the new setting yeah. for us. <laughs> no, just what's he going to say? Does he say anything? He doesn't talk very much, so there's that as well. You have to, you have to get a lot more across with... Mr. Grumpy Face, and then not saying very much, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of that. My, my Dread show tunes pitch was turned back, funnily enough. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's like this, this is a 40 year thing, and there's so much history, and, and you know, that goes behind it. So I think more so than most characters you write, you do, you do yeah. take a, an intake of breath before you kind of have a go at Dread. And that's why, like, when, when you do have a Dread World stuff, like I did Low Life and, uh, for years, and you feel like you almost kind of pay your dues a little bit before you actually have a go at him. Yeah. I like you've, you've, Rob, you've brought a, a touch of magic realism that Dread that I like. Thank you. Your magic horse that turns up every so I'm not talking about the horse. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, what's the horse? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, also Emma I wanted to ask you about um, one of the most recent projects has been working on Judge Anderson who is also as established a character as Dread but um, what, how do you get into, into, into her head which I suppose a lot of people try and do but what's, what's what she like as a character to get to write as because Je- Dread everyone has an idea of who Dread is but Anderson can be a bit more enigmatic sometimes yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the things I like about her. Plus, I like that she's, she's kind of had this big journey uh, in the way Dredd sort of hasn't. And, you know, Dredd's been through a lot, but he's still, still kind of Dredd, and he has fluctuations. But I think she, she shows a lot more on, on the surface, and, and there's a lot to get into there. And I like that she's older now, and she's, she's sort of been through her doubts and, and been away and come back, and she's sort of accepted who she is. So, um, so getting into all of that, and, I, and I'm keen to also get into the side division as a whole and how all the other psychics work together and just you know what it's like to actually work with with a bunch of people who know what you're thinking and if they all know what each other's thinking and all the different sort of powers and stuff that they have so to me it's a a a fun part of that whole um that sandpit to to go and to go and play in um and yeah i mean anderson's anderson's a great a great character and it's nice that she has you know she has funny moments and she's quite um you know, empathetic as well. So she's, you know, she can connect with people, but she can intimidate. She can, she can kind of do it all, and that that makes her a very rich um, character to write. And then uh, you mentioned working in the sandbox. So then the interesting thing is, uh, I suppose as well, when you when you jump out of the sandbox, and you're at the stage where you can talk to us and D and say, I've got a new ongoing series. I want to uh, set up now. Maybe come back to again. Come back to again. Uh, with Equal uh, Asriel, with uh, Zombo books, uh, stories like that. Um, at what stage do you get to, the, to thinking, okay, I've, I've worked on Judge Dredd, I've worked on uh, the established characters, I'm going to try my, my own thing now and make it a permanent part of the 2008 landscape? I think we, well, we were all, all doing that really before, we, before the Dredd stuff. We all had our individual sort of stories, which were just things that we pitched and just wanted to do. 
I mean, uh, yeah, it's not kind of, I mean, that's a kind of thing. The 2000 D is really, there's the Dread World, I mean, there's all the other stuff, but the Dread World is so rich and there's so many different stories that go into it. You can tell any story in, in, in that, but, but yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, just, it's, it wasn't so much like, because I, I kind of see what you're getting at, because in the, in the American sphere of things, the, the route seems to be, well, it's, it's muddied now, but um, there's a weird route where you kind of, in America, where you kind of start off with your own thing and then move to, like, the big, the big lads, the big two, and then move back to your own thing once you've built an audience. And like, whereas in, with 2000 AD, it's like you start off with the small stuff, the future shocks, the thrillers, and then it's like you're kind of clawing for like, what you're after is, is real estate in the prog, like something that's like 10 episodes. And that's gonna be your own thing because you know, you're not gonna get to, to move straight onto Dread, or at least not in, not in my day, I don't know what the rules are now, but uh, yeah, so, so it almost becomes like this necessity that you do come up with your own thing and your own world and pitch that successfully. Um, I think it's only Mike Carroll is about the only person to come in and immediately just kind of have tenure on Dread, isn't it? I mean, everyone else just kind of does other stories first, I think. I mean, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I do remember having this definite sense that, like, when I kind of gingerly pitched to Dread and it got sort of accepted that that was like a big, a big threshold that I crossed in terms of my sort of... Um, Potency. Yes, yes, Rob. <laughs> My potency. When I saw Dred's hard helmet on the page, under my pen, I thought, yes, I'm potent. <laughs> Is that what you wanted to hear, Rob? I think I wanted to hear that. I have that. nothing to contribute to that. <laughs> so um, let's look at then, um, let's get into your, your writer's pain, your writer's process. Okay. <laughs> let's, get, let's, get, let's get really, really dark now, sinister. Um, when you're starting off on a, on a, on a new story, then, um, and you've got the blank, blank page in front of you, how do you break it down? How do you get into the, the story structure? Because not only have you got the, uh, the absolute nature of the story to put in, so you've got to have this story's going to end at this point, then the next project will go to this point, but you've also got to work out, you know, from start, how it's all going to fit together. Is it, is it, Difficult working that sort of style, like very compressed pieces of story, all like um, laid out over weekly parts. That makes sense. <laughs> I don't think that makes sense. I mean, I th in terms of structure, it's just I think the five pages really lend itself to like a like a. It's, it's a three act structure. You haven't got really much room to do mu much else. <clears throat> so you kind of go. Page one is your inciting incident. You know, the world set in the flux. There's a problem that needs solving. Pages two to four. Uh, the main character uh, wants something and they're trying to get it and they can't get it, there's obstacles. And then the twist and, and page five and either the cliffhanger or the end. And in that sense, 2000 AD is kind of structurally quite easy to write, I find, because it's all, I mean, other people might, you can get more complicated with than that, but if you do believe in writing structure, and I, and I do, I think, but, um, that is um, uh, quite straightforward in this sense. Because uh, Rob, as well, you've said that you tend to have a, a single sentence that sums up the story. Yeah. Or you try and work from there, don't you? Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I'm big on theme, and this is where he kicks me, because you're always going on about theme. You and your theme. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, personally, I mean, I know everyone's got a different way of working, but that is um, the, the kind of tether, the sort of the spine of a thing that keeps the story on the straight and narrow and stops me kind of going off in all kinds of stupid directions. I quite like going off in all kinds of stupid directions. I think that's a good working policy. Um, I don't. I. I. I, I get. I've, I've come round to. Um, they appreciate that next door. I've come round to uh, to Rob on theme. I've. I've sort of. I've learned to accept Rob's obsession with theme. Um, but it's like, and I try and. I try and get plenty of like metaphor and get you know work out what message I'm. I'm trying to put forward because if you don't. If you don't think about what message you're putting forward, a message will find you. And, you know, it might not be one that you like. So, you know, you, you might as well get control over that while you've got it, you know. It's not so much preaching, it's putting a leash on it. Um, but, yeah, uh, to, in terms of the structural part, I think if you're told, like, we want 10 episodes, five pages an episode, that immediately... You know, immediately you're looking, you've, you've got a, like, a list of 10 numbers and like, it's like, what happens this episode? 
you know, where does it, I want to start here, I want to end here, where, what happens in each episode? Within those episodes, it's like one, two, three, four, five, what happens on each page? Like Rob was saying, it's like page one, deal with the cliffhanger, page five, set up the new cliffhanger, stuff in between advance to where you need to be for the next episode. It's, it sounds quite mechanical when you, when you say it like that, but at the same time, I feel that's almost one of, one of 2008's strength. It's like the sort of, the kind of, um, there's no room to faff about. There is absolutely no room for decompression. Uh, there's no room for like even having a chat. Uh, characterization, what's that? There was a wonderful, there's a wonderful interview with, I think it's Mills and O'Neill back in the day, where like Kevin O'Neill says something like, oh, there's that thing they do, and that thing they do in American comics these days, where everyone talking, and the info goes, oh, characterization, and like Kevin, like, yeah, that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway. Um, Is it the same for you, Emma? Um, yeah, I mean, I see I'm a big believer in, in structure. I mean, I guess the thing is, you know, you, you, well, I try and lay out what happens in episodes. You know, you submit your outline, and you kind of your excitement levels go from pits where you're really excited and then outline where you're going, yeah, it'll probably work. And then to trying to organize it all into page by page and starting to panic. But yeah, um, it, usually, it usually comes together in the end. The only thing that's really different is because you're doing these sort of, you know, five or six pages and sending them away and then you've only got so many episodes and if you're doing a 20 pager, you get to page 18 and think, you know, actually I could just get rid of something on page two and, and I could have a wee bit more room and, and move the pages back a bit. You can't do that. You've lost, your pages are gone, they're with an artist. So once they're gone, they're gone and you just kind of have to work with it and uh, you don't have a lot of flexibility. So for me, that's been the main difference in doing long, long form versus the episodic because you just, you just don't have that, that flexibility to go back and, and change things and give yourself some more room. So, is there much at 2008? Is there much interaction with the artists, or is it very much you write the scripts, you talk with editorial about it, and the artist will just wherever they are, they'll draw it? Or do you get to talk to them at all, or, or work things through the with artist, them? I don't know about, about you guys, but yeah, sometimes. I mean, I get um, I'm working with, with David Roach just now, and, and you know we have long chats by email and things, and uh, Owen Cavani as well, and he's quite good. He sends the pages, and you know he's very keen to chat but other ones you know I, I see them when they turn up on the doorstep so it's um it's totally totally varies i think you've there's there's a it kind of depends on you and on the artist in terms of if you just sort of write your script and send it off and sit back then the next time you see it will be in the prog um if you sort of send off a script and then you're in on email terms with the artist and you know and they feel like talk to you um, which isn't always the case. Uh, then you can, you know, you can have a chat. You can ask to see the pages as they come in. That might give you an opportunity to do like a lettering script. Like once you see the art, you can make some little changes to the dialogue. And you know, if you get that in in good time, that's all fine. Uh, for I remember Zombo Series Four. Um, I managed to get it together enough to email Henry regularly and like see the art as it came in, and then make changes to lettering so that it fit the art better. And as in, as in, you know, uh, order of people speaking, placement of balloons, like that balloon's going to be way too big to fit in that panel, kind of thing. Um, and I think, I think that made for a much, a much better reading experience. But it's not, it's not always possible to do that all the time. And with the pace that 2000 AD comes out, I think um, that's something. If you want to do that, you've really got to work that out on your own time with the artist and the letterer, and do it all that way. So. You know, up to you to an extent. I think it, that's the amazing thing we're working with people like Henry Flint and, and Disraeli, which I've done a lot of. Um, is um, you don't have usually time to have that letter in proof thing where you go over and, and better you massage the dialogue to better fit the visuals, which you do in American comics. You do that all the time. Um, but then, when the first time you see it, very often is when the prog turns up on your doorstep and you open it up, and the storytelling with those guys is faultless, you know what I mean? It's just, which is amazing. Um, that, that's a real rare thing. Um, but it, it depends on the artist, going back to the original question, it's just some, some you do have a lot of, con sometimes they give story ideas as well, and, it, uh, you know, and, uh, and it's all, you know, it, it works much more sort of cooperatively, and other times you, you have no content whatsoever. And sometimes you have restraining orders. <laughs> 
Uh, on the um, description of this panel, I think it said, how do the writers juggle comedy and pathos? So I'm going to ask you about that in a second. Um, when you're writing 2000 AD stories, um, there is a very specific style of humour sometimes, very subversive, quite political at times. How do you get into that mindset and then make sure that you're not going too far? Or are you allowed to go too far when you're, telling, when you, when you're doing it? Can you, can you be too silly for 2000 AD? Or... I've never felt like I could go too far. Uh, <laughs> I'm not singing a song. Uh, Rob um, wants to sing a song later, so we'll have five Rob, to the end. Rob wants to sing a song. He's talking about it, he's serious. Rob's extreme. Rob's album of standards is burning <laughs> up the charts. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Certainly doing some boo, there's, there's a kind of internal thing where I... Like, if it's obviously if it stops being funny, or if it's just too, if it kind of goes over the line in terms of just not being funny, then and but that's that's a very personal thing. Uh, nobody's nobody's ever. I don't think anyone's certainly not at the script stage has sort of stopped me doing a joke. In terms of the kind of the larger thing of that that balance of pace to comedy, dread, dread is a very funny guy. He's a very quippy guy. He's, he's a bit like Spider-Man. He's always making quips, but they're always so deadpan and like, you know, just tossed off that it's kind of, he's, he's like the grimmest, the grimmest yuckster in comics. <laughs> but it's weird. There is, there is that weird kind of humor thing. And I think if you take that out of Dread, then it's not full dread if there, aren't, if there aren't the gags, if there aren't the little jokes and the little sarcastic deadpan bits from, from, from dread himself, who, you know, and his wacky yucks, and, you know. Uh, when you're writing um, into, into something like uh, Judge Dredd, um, it's got such a, a long history, but the ending, I suppose, does it feel like the ending doesn't belong to you? You're writing the in-between story. How do you find the aspects of Judge Dredd's or his world that is going to is going to tell the interesting middle, if that makes sense? That that idea of um, you know we can't kill off Dredd. I don't think you're allowed to kill off Dredd, um, but you can do a little story where he does this or that or that. How do you find the little parts of the story that you want to tell with Dredd that will fit and make an interesting story for him? I, I kind of killed off Dredd a little bit. I made him disappear out of reality for an episode, so he wasn't in his own story. That was, you know, that was quite that was quite fun to do. Um, but obviously, he was coming back. It's you know, he's got his name on it. He's not going to be out of it. Um, but yeah, that was uh, you know, I think a bit sort of a wee shocking thing that we could, we managed we managed to do. And it actually originally wasn't in the pitch, <laughs> so we sent in the story here. Dread disappears out of existence. Like it's okay, but he's coming back. Don't worry, <laughs> but uh, but he was fine with it. So it was a bit sort of now. No, don't worry about this one. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's fun to do those little things that I don't know. I'm I, I guess I've got that sort of mind where a bit like what can I what can I not do and how can I manage to get it done in this story? I really want to do a Doctor Who story where the Doctor dies, and I, I actually came up with one and submitted it, and it, it it got so far. It was it was you know a way of doing it, but um, yeah. I, I, I'm always looking for things like that, so I guess I achieved that in Dread. <laughs> I always like episodes of Dread where Dread doesn't appear at all. Yeah. I try and I try and do as many of those as I can in like <laughs> long long stories, longer stories. If there's at least one episode where Dread just isn't there at all, I'm 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 always happy. Um, the ideal ending for Dread for me would be if he just died at some point and then the strip just carried on with his name on it, like Tagger. <laughs> uh, and it's just about the supporting cast and all the rest of them because frankly they're, they're as important as he is now and eventually I mean it, not for years not for years but certainly for the 50th anniversary I think that you know he's probably going to have to get popped in the head um, yeah. is that how you do it? That's how, how would you kill off Dread? That's I'd, I'd have him just die like Elvis on the toilet <laughs> <laughs> Dread colon <laughs> <laughs> Dread, dead on toilet, grim, would be the panel description. 
<laughs> that would be the ultimate, ultimate panel. We should, we should go around getting everyone to draw that in a sketchbook. Yeah. It would be the ultimate sketchbook. <laughs> Um, well, I, I guess in terms of like the larger story, I've sort of fallen out of love with the idea of controlling Dread's world because I think that's that's almost a fool's errand. It'll, you know, it'll carry on after you. It'll, you know, it'll carry on mutating after you. You won't any idea that you can sort of control it or introduce parts to it. That's not really up to you. So I guess what I'm, I think what I'd want to do with Dread now, as and when I come back to it, is do the perfect one-off, the perfect six-pager. And like make that the goal of do something that's so perfect in and of itself that it'll it'll have some lasting value, rather than try and sort of make my mark on this this world that will always carry on and always change with like a million under you know a dozen hands. Yeah, I think as well. I mean, it's like, very often with these characters, you you know whether it's Dread or writing for DC or Marvel or whatever, you um you're not you know. The, the ultimate arbiter of these characters' fates, they are going to carry on. So the best thing you can do is, like, there's a good writing rule, I forget who said it, was, like, it's not enough to put these characters' bodies on the line, you've got to put their souls on the line. And I very often try and concentrate on that. You just want to put them in a compelling emotional story that is actually, is putting them at risk in one sense, even if it's not entirely, even if you know, we all know Dread's going to be around at the end of the tale, you know what I mean? But you can't, you can still tell a story which kicks the shit out of him, either physically or emotionally or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah. We'll get, we'll get the readers to really invest into some hapless citizen or supporting judge, and then just really do them in, really give them a kicking. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. I mean, the be like, same, one of the, some of the best Dread stories are not particularly about Dread, you know what I mean? And that's the richness of the, of the strip. Um, we're going to have uh, some audience questions coming up in uh, a minute or so. I'm just going to ask one of the questions that normally gets asked at these first, so I'm going to catch you up. Um, are there any characters you've not written yet for 2000 AD that you'd like to, or any series, or any, any type of stories you'd want to perhaps do in future? I had an answer for this that's no longer accurate, which is, you know, if people have been following me to these panels, that's a little bit of a spoiler for the 40th anniversary. Um, I guess now, uh, I, does it have to be a 2000 AD character? I'd like to do Kids Rule OK. Okay. <laughs> Agro yeah. is a way of life in Kids Rule OK. I have no idea what that is. Oh, it's, it's action comic. Look, look it up. It's amazing. It's one of the greatest covers of all time. Uh, this kid with a chain like hanging over a policeman and the policeman's going, oh, like, no, don't kill me. And it's like, Agro is a way of life in Kids Rule OK. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Emma, yourself, anyone? Um, well, maybe the, the only bear on the CIA most wanted list. <laughs> I think that might be that might be fun. Bring back Shaco. All gonna, every now and again, I get drunk with friends. He goes, yeah, "Should we do Shaco? Should we do Shaco? Bring him back!" Bring and then back. the next morning, I always go, uh, "Not entirely sure it's a good yeah, idea." But but uh, there's there's a way to do it. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I'm I just very have to crack I'm very it. jealous that Sai gets to do hook jaw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kick him off if you want. We could do that. God, just, what? What? Kill him. <laughs> This is a very public place to discuss this. <laughs> Sorry, I'll do it after the panel. Um, so, um, uh, Rob, did you answer the uh, question? I'd, I'd chance, rather so. go on ABC Warriors, but I don't think Pat would let me. But mm. I think, yeah, that'd be kind of fun. I mean, again, if you know, I need a hand of that, we can sort it out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, things. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. Um, right, so um, I think we're going to ask a few questions to the audience, if anyone's got anything. Um, just put your hand up if you've got one. And I think there's a guy at the back's going to come around with a microphone and, and find you. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Uh, just over there. Any <coughs> current 2000 AD um, artists that you haven't worked with yet that you would like to and you think would work well with you? Um, well, I'll, I'll grab this for you. Um, I've not done anything with Tom Foster yet. And... Yeah, well, I've, I've got him now. <laughs> Aww. I like I like his I like his style. I like he's he's I think the only person who's seems to have been really influenced by uh I mean there there are loads of artists who've been like influenced by Bond, but he like I feel like he's sort of the newest 
Well, it's hard to describe. I don't know. I feel like I'm sort of um, I'm getting into some murky waters if I talk about artistic influences. But yeah, I really I really like where he's going and where he is now, and I feel like he's only going to sort of get more interesting and more like. And he's already really good, and I think he's only going to get better. So I'd quite like to uh, hitch my wagon to his rising star and exploit him. Um, Rob, as, as well, for you. For you. I can't Does think of anyone. Anyway. I'm kind of happy with the guys I've, I've worked with, to be honest with you. I mean, I get, I get to work with people like Henry Flint and like seeing Chris Weston and Disraeli and whatever. But um, yeah, Tom Foster's very good. But, yeah, um, I, put, I put Disraeli on my, on my wish list, definitely. I just love, love his work, love it. Um, but uh, yeah, and also Tom. Tom's amazing. Okay. I wouldn't mind working with Disraeli. He's really good. <laughs> He gave it a side eye when he said that, you know. We're all we'll just fight over him. Like we're all just going to go out and have a fight over, like, <laughs> Disraeli and Tom Foster. Scratch his other's eyes out. I figured that's how we end, that's how we end the panel before that would be. Has um, anyone else got any questions? I saw some other hands go up. There's one right at the front here, sorry. I'll, I'll pass in this one. Thanks. Emma, um, what's the chances? I've asked David Richardson this. What's the chances of getting a certain time lord turning up in the Meg? Um, <laughs> that's not one that I could answer, but I think licensing-wise, it would be complicated. It, it, it's possibly it, not impossible, but um, I think uh, the decision making on that would would take a very long time. So it, it could happen, but it would probably be literally years before any anything could go forward. And I, I don't know whether it would be in the Meg or if it would be in Titan or what it would be. But it it was an interesting idea. Interesting idea. I uh, did mean to ask earlier, actually, um, obviously one thing that distinguishes 2000 as well is that you're working um, with editorial who have been there for, for, for years. Matt's been working on it for a very long time. Um, what's it like going back and forth with Matt? What's he like as an editor? What's it like being a writer under his uh, evil rule? I, think I, I, I really like working for Matt because Matt's very... Um, uh, he doesn't... He leaves you to it. He doesn't sort of... Some editors want to get their fingers into your story and muck it all up. Um, Matt, Matt actually gives, usually gives you me a couple of like very brief editorial notes and I always think he's made a good point um, and then he just lets you go. Um, so that's great, that's, that's, that's kind of what you want really, he makes it pretty straightforward. Yeah, he, he gives very good, very good notes, very kind of cuts right to the heart of it, um, which is always good. He says, um, I actually, um, it's kind of weird that he's still that he's still in the because obviously I I kind of owe him my career in the you know if he hadn't taken a chance on that first future shock and given me you know given me a couple of uh, give me some notes and some feedback and like said you know if you buff this up and change this and do that uh, we'll take it um, if he hadn't done that if he if he'd gone the route of saying this is woeful. Then you know I might not I might not be sitting here. So um, obviously I, I owe I owe Matt a very great deal. Um, and but yeah, working working with him, he's just he's really good at just cutting right to. If he doesn't like something, he'll like he'll let you know exactly why in a very succinct uh, and useful way, which is which is worth its weight in gold. Yeah, I concur with all of that. And in, in you know Matt gives you very specific pointers and says maybe this maybe that um, but yeah he's generally just wants you to tell a story you want to tell and lets you and lets you do that and supports you to do that and um, and I don't know <laughs> he's this thing where when you send in scripts and art you kind of get this two words of feedback yeah. I don't know if he's aware that he does this but this sort of goes on this sliding sliding scale of sort of reads fine to great stuff and I think someone got an awesome once <laughs> um, so oh, it's, it's rare. Like <laughs> there's, there's a kind of Victorian dad amount of praise with Matt when you, you really get it but when you do get it you almost fall off your I chair know, it's, it's, like, it's sort of the, it's just you know he holds it back and then when you get it you're like oh my god for years the line was you would get a thing back we, we used to talk about this and it would say I see no problems with this. <laughs> and you would go that's high praise indeed <laughs> and then one day you get a this is good. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, oh my god! <laughs> I think we used to say, uh, well, but uh, at some point he would break and say, "I see nothing but problems." With this. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, do I have any more questions? Anyone else? Uh, I've got, uh, I'll come to you as well. Hey guys, what's the sort of timelines that you work to from, say, taking a brief before the program's actually out in the newsstands? It all it kind of depends on the on the scheduling because sometimes I don't know sometimes you'll do something for a slot that will be like much later in the year. Um, I don't know. There's not that. I don't feel that same because with a, with American comics, I've got a very clear idea of when it's going to be out, and um, I don't always have that information with 2000 AD. It's like I'll sort of, oh, uh, you know, I'll get the. I'll pitch the thing, Matt will be like, yeah, and then, you know, either I'll, either I'll hand it in without needing a nudge or I'll need a nudge. Um, and then it'll be in and it'll be being drawn. But again, you know, unless you're sort of talking to the artist, you're not really part of that process. Unless you're sort of following the letterer or friends with the letterer, you're not really part of the process on when it gets lettered. You don't really know when it's going to happen. And like a couple of times in the past, I've sort of, you know, at a con, I've said to Matt, oh, yeah, when's this coming out? And you know, and then I've got the answer, but otherwise I wouldn't know. So it's it's hard to quantify. Yeah, sometimes you don't know, and things it, generally it's turned up in the prog, and you go, "Oh, I didn't even know that was coming out yet." And there it is. So yeah. Yeah, I had um, Anderson's story. I was doing, and I I'd, I'd literally just sent in a, this the last script, and and it arrived on the on the doorstep, and it started, and I was like, "Oh my god, okay, so one more to do." Better get it in. So it was just kind of um, I didn't. I had no idea it was going to be such a fast turnaround. But um, yeah, but the art was really fast. So, so it just appeared, and I was still writing the last part of the story, and everyone was already reading it. So that was that was quite a strange experience. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Anyone else? I'm in the middle of you now. Anyone? No. All right. Okay. Um, one last question then before we uh, we end the panel. I uh, just thought it'd be quite useful. I spoke to a few people about what the panel would be. A lot of people said, one thing I want to know is advice for how to write in comics. Um, have you got any advice for just, not just the idea of, you know, just you've got to just keep pushing, 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 but how do you actually, you know, write something that you think editors will like? How do you get into that mindset of writing something that's going to be a professional piece of work? Right, 2000 AD's got some very good guidelines because they're not just like what you have to do, the technicals. There's also on the same webpage, there's some good advice there. So I'd, I'd make that your first protocol. Aside from that, the one big bit of advice, and this is the bit I keep pushing and pushing and pushing on everybody, is start small and finish it. Uh, don't, don't like think, oh, I've got my 600 page graphic novel about elves. <laughs> it's like, if, you know, if you've got that in you, that's fine. Um, Crack on with that. If that's your big dream, crack on with that. But while you're doing that, take a little time out and do a two-pager or a one-pager with like a beginning, a middle, and end. Something you can give to an artist and you know that there is a much better chance they will do it. Um, and then you have something. And, I, and that's the wonderful thing about the future shows, that they're four pages, twist ending. If you can write a four-page script, you don't have to send it in to, to Matt. Uh, or, you know, you can... Give it to an artist uh, that you know, someone you know, there's, it's four pages, there's a good chance they won't sack that off. Not a hundred percent chance, they, you know, they might do like one panel and then decide they want to be a drummer. Um, but there's a good chance, of it. and then you've got something. Put five of those together, you've got a little anthology. Um, there's a guy, Rory McConville, I believe. I think he's new in the prog, and the first time I met him, he handed me one of those anthologies full of like a bunch of short magic realist stories. He's got a bunch of different artists to do them. Um, I think magic realist is right. I don't know, I might be misusing that term. But uh, like with the horse. Talking about the horse. But um, the, uh, yeah, basically, and that was immediately, I was like, this is somebody to follow, this is somebody to watch, because he, he put some together and it was, it was starting small, it was finishing what it started. So those are the two biggies. Don't don't start on your like your six issue. I've had people come up to me with like his first issue, my six issue mini series, and it's like, well, that's great, but what I'd really like is like here's a an anthology of really tiny pieces, so you know, see the whole range kind of thing. Anyway, that's that's my advice for everybody. Start small, finish it. 
So you buy the 2000 AD script book, which is not, I've got no royalties from that, but it's, um, it's a really good way. I mean, if you want to write for the prog or you want to write professionally for comics, look how other people do it and, 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 and structure your stuff so that when you put your stuff in front of an editor, the first thing they see is, oh, this person looks professional, which is half a, ba half a battle because they're going to get so much stuff which is going to look like a bag of shit coming through the door. So if your stuff comes through and it looks properly and it's laid out properly and they see that you've you've paid attention to form, you've paid attention to structure. And, um, and structures, you know, learn structure, read books on sort of, you know, screenwriting structure and things like this. Don't worry too much about how you're going to get your big break. Worry about mastering the craft and getting better at it and, and you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with all of that. Um, read scripts, absolutely. Try and find a bunch of scripts, not just Alan Moore ones. Find, find a bunch and... Um, and, and really get to grips with how, how scripts work and uh, the, the sort of mechanisms of, of all of that. Um, and, and yeah, do short things, definitely. If you can do something short and tight and, and well-crafted, then it, it will say everything ab about your ability. So, so yeah, I agree with, agree oh, with one everyone. Last, one last point. Try and subvert, ask yourself, subvert cliches, because going into future shocks and sci-fi, uh, cliches just throw themselves at you. So if you're going to open your pitch to the editor with, it is a dystopian future. If I was an editor, I'm probably going, this person, no. You know, unless you show quickly that you can do something really interesting and, you know, to, you know with that, then you, you, you're going to struggle. You're kind of, so, yeah. A tip I got from Andy Dougal on future shocks is take your twist, put it on page one. Uh, what's the story that comes out of that twist? What is the twist you get from that? That that immediately puts you ahead of everyone else in the slush pile. Um, also, format. You were talking about format. Don't just talk to an editor about format. Talk to a letterer. Letterers will tell you what they need. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff like uh, dialogue in all capitals. Letterers hate that. Um, so little things like that. Yeah, talk, talk to a letterer if you can find one. Um, they're on Twitter, you know. To poke them through the bars of their cages. They'll love that. Um, so just finally, to ask you all, um, what are you currently working on? What, uh, what can we look forward to for you, from you over the next few weeks and months? I'm um, doing Suicide Squad for DC Comics and um, Unfollow uh, for Vertigo, and I'm still doing a few Doctor Whos for Titan Comics. A um, bunch of superhero stuff for Marvel Comics. Uh, the next 2000 AD thing is a Zombo one-off in the 40th anniversary special, which might lead into another series if I can get it together. And uh, for 2000 AD readers, the American thing of mine they'll probably enjoy the most is the upcoming Rocket Raccoon series, which is uh, it's just called Rocket, and it's very 2000 AD-like in its, in its writing style. Uh, I'm doing another Anderson series, and uh, also an Alienist, the Alienist series with Gordon Rennie. Um, hopefully, some more survival geeks working on that, uh, and and yeah, hopefully, some more, some more who. So we'll we'll see how those things happen. All right, uh, can we have a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you all. Thank you.